Hi, this is Matt the Game Explainer, and in this video I'm going to be showing you a brand new game called Treasure Mountain. Uh, it's published by August Games and was designed by Daniel George and Kate Blevins. It's for two to four players and takes roughly 30 minutes per player to play. Okay, so thematically in this game, each player is uh, controlling a family or a clan of dwarves and you're going to be taking turns placing your dwarves out onto the board in order to uh, build a bigger mine in Treasure Mountain because you're trying to mine gems from Treasure Mountain. So you can see all the gems over here in the supply. Um, and so you need to build your mine bigger and mine different kinds of gems and then you're going to use those gems in order to uh, uh, sell them at the gem market to gain gold. You can also use your gems to uh, impress the Dwarf King here and claim these achievement cards. Um, and you know, that's basically the engine of the game. Um, so there's some tile laying here where you're building out your mine. You're collecting more and more mine tiles and it's you have to build your mine properly and I'll show you that in just a moment. Um, and then you're going to take actions to get the gems from your mine tiles out into your personal supply so that you can then use those gems, as I mentioned, to get gold and claim achievements. Now, the other thing, though, that you have to watch out for in this game is there are dragons that live in Treasure Mountain. That Those are depicted by this stack of dragon tiles right here. And there's this dragon aggression track. Now, there are certain action spaces on the board that when players take them, there's a chance that um, they're going to um, aggravate the dragon, which will move the dragon marker one space along the dragon aggression track. When the uh, marker gets to the end of the track, that's going to cause the top dragon tile um, to be uh, to attack basically all the players. And uh, the dragons are always trying to steal play either uh, the player's gold or their mined gems. And so you one of the things you're trying to balance in this game is you're taking actions right with your dwarves to uh, you know, build a bigger mine and get more gems and sell your gems and claim achievements. You're also needing to keep an eye on how aggressive the dragons are getting because if you don't spend some actions to prepare for the next dragon attack, you might find yourself losing some of your gems or some of your gold. Also, when a dragon successfully attacks a player, so the player doesn't defend against the attack, then um, that player is going to lose their highest numbered dwarf meeple um, to the dragon jail over here, and so for the end of until the end of that game round, so you basically end up losing one of your workers for the rest of the game round. So it's a pretty stiff penalty. So you really want to make sure you're paying attention to the dwarf, or sorry, to the dragons, and making sure that you are hopefully in a position to defend properly against them. Now, obviously, I'll explain a little bit later how the dragon attacks actually get resolved, okay? But that's just kind of the overall feel of the game is you're, you're kind of building your little engine here with your mine, your, you know, your gem engine, and you're you know, trying to be as efficient and effective as possible at cranking out victory points, but you're also having to balance that against preparing for the next dragon attack. Now, I do have the table set up for a four-player game, right? So each player starts with a little bit of stuff in terms of like a, a two-tile mine with some gems on it, a little bit of money, a beer barrel there, um, which is another resource you can use in the game is beer, um, a six-sided die, and then this is a spell card. Now the spell card is actually from an expansion. So I do have the, the game set up with the expansion called um, Caverns of Gandom. Um, I'll explain the expansion at the end of the video, but just to show you what the expansion consists of, it's this sideboard here, um, some additional tiles in the um, mine tile stack, and then these purple gems, and of course the spell cards. So that's really what you get with the expansion. So it doesn't really add a lot of complexity to the game, it just allows for casting spells, but um, it is a nice addition to the game, and I wanted to just make one video showing everything that you can get so far for this game. But most of my time will be spent on explaining the base game. Also, this was a, a game that was funded on Kickstarter. Um, the only thing I think that I have set up on the table here that does not come in the retail edition of the game are these metal coins over here. Uh, the game does come with cardboard coins. So let me go ahead and show you those. Okay, so these are the retail edition um, cardboard coins, ones, fives, and tens. Okay, they're pretty nice. And the metal coins here, um, again, you know, can be purchased separately. Well, I guess probably while supplies last. These were a Kickstarter extra, you know, add-on. Um, they're a little bit smaller than the cardboard ones, but um, they're, they're really nicely designed. <clears throat> okay, 
So what are the kind of unique aspects of this game? Because there's obviously a lot of worker placement games out there. Um, this game does actually feature a couple of really interesting me new mechanisms that um, enhance the worker placement experience. The first is that um, all of your uh, dwarf workers here are numbered, one through five. Here's an example of a number five for the red player. Now, um, the reason they're numbered is, first of all, players have to place them out in numerical order and in player order. So, you know, this was randomly determined, but the red player would go first and they would place their number one dwarf. Then the yellow player would place their number one dwarf and so on in, until you get to the end of the number ones and then you start placing number twos. But the reason they're really that they're numbered is that um, when you go to place one of your dwarves, if you want to place your dwarf on an action space that's currently occupied by another player's dwarf, you can bump that dwarf off of the action space if the opponent's dwarf's number is lower than your dwarf's number. Okay, so thematically, the number is supposed to represent the length of the dwarf's beard, right? The older the dwarf, the longer the beard, ha ha ha. So the older dwarves can bump off the younger dwarves from, the, from their opponents and still be able to take the action you want to take. But the cool thing is, if one of your dwarves gets bumped off of an action space, then it comes back to the tavern here, okay? And then you're going to be able to place that dwarf again on a future turn. So basically, getting your dwarves bumped in this game is a good thing, because you're going to get extra actions with them. So that's what part of the strategy of the game, is trying to determine where other players are going to want to go, and you go there first <clears throat> with your lower number of dwarves, and then that way your dwarves are going to get bumped and you're going to get more actions with them. So that's a really neat aspect. Um, I know there was another game called Lancaster that involved, you know, bumping workers off of action spaces, but that game worked a little differently. You didn't actually get to take the action when you first placed your worker there. You had to wait till all the workers had been placed out, and then you get to take your actions. Here, as soon as you place a worker or a dwarf, you're going to take the action. And then if they get bumped, you get to place them back out and take another action. So it's a really nice kind of positive reinforcement thing. Um, the other really cool aspect of this game is, as I zoom in and show you the rest of the board, uh, a number of these action spaces are called all-play spaces. And what that means is when a player places their dwarf on an all-play space, like this uh, tunnel action here, okay, where you can grab one of these face-up tunnel tiles and add it to your mind, um, the player who placed their dwarf there, they get to take the action first, and of course, and they get to gain a bonus because it's an all-play space. But then every other player in player order is also going to be able to take that same action. So by going to an all-play space, you're actually granting another action to the other players. However, if you, you know, pay attention to what your other players are doing and you time it properly, then you're actually going to hopefully be able to take the action and, and maybe some of the other players won't be in a current position to take that action as well. Um, so that's part of the other kind of cool strategy and timing of this game. You know, when do you want to trigger the all-play spaces? So. So that's kind of a, the, the twist that this game offers on your standard worker placement game. Otherwise, you know, it's got the tile laying, engine building, right? Trying to get different types of gems into your mine, building a bigger mine so you can mine more gems. That way you'll be able to, um, you know, sell those gems for gold and trade them in for achievements and, and, you know, be as effective as possible in the game. Okay, so that's kind of the, the engine, the flow of the game. Um, so the game is going to take place over a certain number of rounds, and because I have this set up with the expansion and with four players, you play with four dwarves per player and you play over four rounds. Um, if you're just playing the base game without the expansion and you have four players, you'd actually play five rounds, but each player would only have three dwarves. It kind of helps to make sure that the length of the game stays fairly consistent, no matter whether you're using the expansion or not, and whether you, you know, no matter how many players you have. Okay, um, so let me show you some examples of some of the ways that you can earn points in the game. Um, in addition to claiming points during the game, right, from doing achievements, defeating dragons, um, and a few, you know, there's a few other spots, um, you're also going to earn a lot of points at the end of the game, okay? And so every player has one of these little reference cards that shows you that um, as you build out your mine by getting more mine tiles into your mine, then by the end of the game, you're going to look at your mine and say, well, how many of each type of tile do I have? For example, how many of these um, uh, ruby tiles do I have? If I have at least three ruby tiles, I'll get five points. If I have at least five ruby tiles, I get ten points for that. 
and you 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 know you uh, assess that for each type of tile that's in the available in the game. So you can get a lot of end game points just by having built a big mine. Also, at the end of the game, every gold coin you have is worth two points, but every mined gem is only worth one. So obviously, uh, you know, one of the things you're trying to do during the game is convert mined gems into gold because gold is worth twice as much. And then. Um, if you still have gems left in your mine, sitting on your mine tiles at the end of the game, each of those gems is worth a half a point. So this is a, a you know a way to score a lot of points at the end of the game. Uh, let me show you some example mine tiles. Okay, <clears throat> um, like I said, you know when you take the tunnel action, you get to pick a mine tile from a face-up display here and add it into your mine. So some examples of what those tiles are, are like uh, this is a you know number two. Uh, sapphire tile. So it, if you took this tile uh, with the tunnel action, you would then um, add it to your mine and put two sapphire gems on it. Um, the lower number tiles have more uh, connecting points for uh, track because you need to be able to connect every one of your mine tiles back to the entrance of your mine uh, by using tracks. You also have to make sure you have tracks connected tracks and rock connects to rock. So for example, if you grabbed this, um, you know, four uh, emerald tile, you would get four emeralds on it, but you'd have to make sure you're connecting this track to one of your other tracks while not, you know, blocking tracks with these wall tiles or wall edges. <clears throat> There's also some um, special tiles that you can get. For example, Migrant Gnomes. Um, it doesn't give you any gems when you add it to your mine, but every time you take the mining action for the rest of the game, you're going to be able to mine two extra gems out of your mine. So it makes that particular action for you more efficient. Right? So there's quite a few variety of those special tiles in the game. <clears throat> so that's um, you know basically what you're trying to do in terms of uh, getting a bigger mine and adding tiles to your mine. Now, w once you start building a bigger mine and mining gems and getting other resources in the game like beer barrels and axes and things like that and money, right? What are you going to do with all that stuff? Well, one of the things you can do is the Dwarf King, he um, he wants to reward players for having accomplished certain things throughout the game. So he's always going to have a, a set of cards, face-up cards here, that players can claim by going to the Dwarf King space. And then you simply claim one card from the face-up display if you have the right amount of the right stuff. So for example, um, if you had four uh, tiles in your mine, right? doesn't matter what they are, you just have to have four tiles in your mine, then you can claim this card and get three victory points. Now you don't give up the tiles, you just have to have them and you, and you get the points. Same thing with the, with the achievement cards that relate to gems. If you happen to have five diamonds, you could claim this card to get three points. Now these are all starting cards, so they're all worth the same. Like this one is having three beer barrels. You just have to have the barrels and you get the card. Um, this one though is a level one card, so it's a little deeper in the deck. If you have four, uh, four rubies and four sapphires, you could claim the card to get eight points. And so on. And as you get you know further along in the game and further deeper into the deck, some of the cards will be worth even more points, but they're obviously a little harder to claim. So that's one of the things you can do in the game is again you can time when you go to the Dwarf King, because it's an all-play space, so that you can claim one of the cards, but you look around at the table and say, Well, can anybody else claim any of the cards? If they can't, then the taking that all-play action at that time is really going to benefit you. Now, there is a little bit of obviously luck in the game in terms of every time somebody claims a card or a tile on an all-play space, that card or tile gets replaced with a new card or tile from the top of the deck. So sometimes, you know, a card will show up um, that benefits another player and you, know, you obviously didn't expect it, but a little bit of luck of the draw there. Um, but anyway, so that's kind of the Dwarf King achievement cards, right? The other thing you can do with all these gems that you've mined is you can go to the gem market up here and you can sell your gems to get gold. Because if you remember from the end game scoring card, gold is worth twice as much as mine gems at the end of the game. So one of the things you want to do is you're getting more and more gems out of your mine is go up here and sell them to get the cash. Okay. Um, so that's basically the main idea of the game. Um, the other resources you'll have that come with the game, as I mentioned, there's beer barrels. It comes with these cute little wooden uh, barrels of beer. Uh, I don't know if that's focusing or not, but that's what the beer barrels look like. Um, and then the game also comes with these wooden dirt pile tokens, right? Which um, one of the actions you'll see that you can take in the game is called excavate up here. And so that's a way to add more gems onto your mine tiles. Once you've started to deplete your mine tiles of gems, 
you can get more gems put into your mine, but um, when you do that, you also have to add a dirt pile onto that mine tile so that over the course of the game, the more that you excavate, the more dirt you have and the less gems you have. Okay, so you'll see how that works, but it's kind of a cute mechanism to uh, reflect reality, right? That you can only mine so many gems out of a certain spot before that spot's all tapped out. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and also show you a couple of the dragon tiles, because as I mentioned, one of the things you would need to prepare for in this game is a periodic dragon attack. Um, so what you do is you, you seed a stack of tiles here with um, five level two dragons and two level one dragons. And of course the level one dragons you put on top. Now, <clears throat> each dragon tile on the back is going to tell you what the range of dragon strength is. So this one's a range of three to six, and it's worth eight victory points to the player that can claim it when this dragon attacks. Now, let's say, you know, players were taking actions and it moved the dragon aggression token all the way to the end of the track here, right? Then when that happens, boom, the top dragon on the, t on the stack will attack. So how do we resolve dragon attacks? Well, what's going to happen is there's two ways to do it. The base kind of rule is that each player first rolls a six-sided die, okay? And that sets their base defense for that dragon attack, right? And then um, players, if they've collected any axe tokens, will be able to secretly add as many axe tokens as they'd like to, to their die roll, right? So let me show you what the axe tokens look like. Um, there's two different kinds. There's um, ones that say plus one, and then there's other ones that say plus two. Now, 75% of the tokens in the bag are plus one, only 25% are plus two. So whenever you draw, or whenever you gain an axe token by taking an action, you always draw it from the bag and odds are you're going to draw plus one. But every once in a while you get a plus two. So, you know, if, if a player has been taking actions to get axes, right, and they have a stack of face down axe tokens there, then when the dragon attacks, after the players have rolled their dice, then each player, like I said, in player order, will decide how many axe tokens they want to uh, commit to the battle. And you, you don't show the other players the value of your axe tokens. You just have to tell them how many your axe tokens you're committing. So in this case, maybe this player is committing three tokens to augment the two that he rolled, okay? So once every player has done that, then you reveal the dragon, right? And in this case, the dragon had a strength of five, and he's trying to steal gold, okay? Remember, each dragon is either trying to steal gold or gems. So the front of the tile will tell you that. So, once the dragon tile has been revealed, then each player reveals their axis, okay, and determines whether they successfully defended against the dragon or not. Now, in this case, the red player had a two, and he committed three plus one axis, so his total is five. Now, as long as you equal or exceed the dragon, then you're fine. And in this case, he did, right? The dragon was five, and his total defense was five, so the red player is fine. He's not going to get any of his gold stolen from that dragon, or by that dragon. Now, if your total of your die plus your axes is less than the dragon, some bad things happen. First of all, in this case, because this dragon wants gold, that player would lose half of their gold rounded up back to the bank. Also, that player would lose their highest value dwarf meeple for the rest of the round, right? So the dwarf meeple would get placed over here into the um, dragon jail. So, obviously, one of the things you really want to try to do in this game is not lose to a dragon attack. Unless you happen to be in a situation where you're, you're not really going to lose much in terms of gems or gold, then you know, maybe it's not that big of a deal. But you still lose your highest value dwarf meeple for the rest of the round. Now, regardless, right, you, we resolve the battle for each player, determining you know, which player was successful in defending, which players were not. And then we look at, of the players who were successful in defending, which one had the highest total? Okay, so which one with their dice plus their axes had the highest total against the dragon? That player gets to claim the dragon tile and get the eight victory points in this case. So defending against the dragon is not only important for saving your stuff, but it can also be really important for getting those precious extra victory points that can maybe swing the difference for you in the game. So that's how a dragon attack works. Now there is a variant in the rule book called the Rotto variant. If you're familiar with Richard Hamm or Rotto, who uh, does a lot of uh, video, you know, um, playthroughs and, and reviews of games. 
Um, he did a, a video, you know, review and playthrough of this game, and he decided that he didn't like how the dice worked, how each player had their own die. Because what that means is, you know, one player might roll a six, another player rolls a one, and, you know, now that means, you know, one player has an advantage over another, possibly, right? So what he said is it'd be better if just a single die was rolled for all players. So the designer really liked that idea and decided to include a black die in the game. So that way, if the players at the beginning of the game decide to resolve dragon attacks by using a single die instead of each player having their own die, you can do that. And then that way, when the dragon attacks, you simply roll one die and all players get that base defense. And then each player still can add axes to augment the die roll for themselves, but at least each player has a has the same die of value at the start of the, of the combat. So that's um, the Rado variant, and you can use it or not, depending on, you know, what style of game you like to have. Okay, um, so that's how the dragon attacks work. Let me go ahead and take the camera, and I'm going to zoom in closer onto the board and show you how all the different action spaces work. Okay, so let me show you the tavern here again real quick. This is where all the, the player's dwarves start at the beginning of each round. Um, these red uh, tavern spaces... Um, are where if you want to adjust the player order for the next round, you can take one of your dwarves. You know, let's say the blue player was tired of going last. They could, when it's their turn, they could place a dwarf here. And that means on the next round, they're going to be the first player. Okay. And of course, you can gain a small bonus if you take positions two, three, or four. Um, this has a red background because when a dwarf is placed on one of these spots, it cannot be bumped off the spot. Okay. All right. So that's the tavern. Um, the tunnel is an all-play space, which has this icon here. So anytime you see that icon, that means it's an all-play. The thing in the circle is the bonus that the player is going to get if they take and put their dwarf there. So if the red player takes this action, he's going to get two beer barrels, and then he'll get first pick of one of these four tiles. Now, let's say he buys this um, number four um, ruby tile, and he has to pay either a beer barrel or a coin to do that. He can take it, and he would have to add it down into his mine here, right? So, for example, he could add it here. As long as it's connected to tracks and goes back to the entrance, it's good. And then he would get four rubies and put those onto the tile, okay, like so. Okay, so that's expanding your mine. And now that he has at least three ruby tiles at the end of the game, that's going to qualify him for five bonus victory points for ruby tiles. Now, one thing you should note when you're building your mine, this is the entrance. So outside here is, you know, outside the mountain. So you have to build your mine this way, this way, and up that way. Okay? Okay, so that's um, that. And then, you know, when the tile is taken, everything else will shift down. And you can draw from any one of these three stacks to replace like that. Okay, in the most expensive position. And then the next player, because it's all play, the next player in player order, yellow, would get to choose and buy one of these four tiles. Okay? So that's how tunneling works. That's how you build a bigger mine. Once, and then if you want to get the gems out of your mine, you would take the mine action. Again, it's all play. The bonus is two gems. Um, you pick one type of gem that you have in your mine, and you're going to mine that type of gem only when you take the mine action. So, for example, the red player, if you wanted to take the mine action now, the only thing he has in his mine are rubies. So he would, he would of course, choose rubies. Now, when you once you've chosen the type of gem you're going to mine, you then look at how many um, tiles of that type do I have connected that all contain gems. Do you have if you have two, then you're going to get one bonus gem when you do the mine action. If you have at least three tiles connected that all contain gems at the start of the action, then you get a bonus of two gems. So in this case, he would look and say, "Okay, well I got three tiles. They all contain gems, so I'm going to get two bonus rubies, right?" So if I did the mining action, you take first one from each tile, like so, and then you get two extra, and you can take them from any of those tiles. So I could say, well, I'll take it from here and take it from there, right? So by doing one mine action like that, he was able to get five rubies out of his mine, all right? So that's the mining action, and again, it's all play, so all players would get to do that. Now, once you've got those gems, what should you do with them? Well, like I said, if you go to the Dwarf King space, it's all play. You get two bonus victory points for going to the action. And then he could claim, he's got five rubies now, so he could go ahead and claim this card to get three victory points. And just like everything else in the game, when you claim a card, you know, everything else shifts down, and then you replace from the top of the deck. And then the next player, because it's all play, would get to choose one of the cards if they're able to do so. And you can see other cards, like if you have one dragon tile in front of you, so you defeated a dragon and claimed it, you know, that would get you three points. If you have two axe tokens in front of you, you could get that. 
This is nine of any type of gem, doesn't matter what they are. You know, so there's a lot of different variety in the cards. And this one, you actually, you can get points for having dirt piles in your mind. Okay? All right, so let's go ahead and talk about the dirt piles. Um, the excavate action here. Uh, when you take it, you can do it up to three times. Each time it costs a beer barrel or a coin. And then you can place three new gems onto one mine tile in your mine, minus however many dirt tokens are already there. And then once you've placed the gems, then you get to add a new dirt token. All right. So, for example, if I wanted to uh, repopulate, you know, like, say, this tile here, okay, it doesn't have to be empty. It's just I want to add more gems to it. So if I want to add more gems here, um, I could take the excavate action, you know, pay the, pay the cost, and then I would add three more rubies, right, one, two, three, and then I would add a dirt pile token, like so. All right, and that is... Um, how the, ex how the excavate action works. Now, the next time I want to excavate on this tile, I would only add two rubies because I already have one dirt pile. Remember, the formula is three gems minus dirt piles. So the more you excavate on a single tile, the less gems you're going to get and the more dirt you're going to get. Now, <clears throat> once you have all these gems again, you can sell them at the gem market. Again, it's an all-play space. You get two coins for going there. And there's always two cards for each type of gem. And you can um, choose whichever card you want. So if this guy was selling rubies, for example, he's got five rubies available to sell right now. He could say, well, okay, I'm going to go ahead and sell three of the rubies to get two gold coins. But now you'll notice in each area there is an arrow spot and a coin spot. And the reason for that is at the end of each round, during the reset phase, we're going to add one coin onto each of these gold coin cards. So the cards that are sitting in the coin slots, the longer they're not claimed, the more gold coins are going to be on them, making them more valuable. And when you finally somebody does finally claim a card in a coin spot, then the next card slides over and we put a new card here. Okay, So that's how um, that works. And of course, as you start claiming cards, you know, the cards that come out are going to be better. They, you can trade in more gems to get more gold, etc. These are all starting cards. Okay, so that's the gem market. Again, it's an all-play space. Um, there's a few other spots here, like the going to the forge. You can pay to get uh, to draw one axe token from the axe bag. Um, the uh, temple here, you can um, turn in two gold coins to score five victory points. And as long as you have a dwarf... Okay, sorry about that, folks. I um, got interrupted with by a phone call. But uh, anyway, the temple allows you, while you have your dwarf there, to get a reroll when the dragon attacks. Um, the trading post here, um, you can do two actions. Basically, you can you know pay to get things like axes and barrels and gems. And you can also turn in gems for money. Um, then finally, all of the dragon ag aggression spots down here, you can um, basically come down here, get two beer barrels, and then you have to roll your die. Okay, anytime you see this symbol, when you take an action, you have to roll the die. And if you roll, you know, at least a three as it shows down here, three or higher, then that's what's going to cause this dragon to advance one space on the track. Okay, So these all these dragon aggression spots, these are like the best, you know, most efficient spaces on the board, and they don't help the other players, but they might anger the dragon. Um, the scout, you get to draw an axe from the bag, and you get to look at the top dragon tile, so you'll know exactly what his strength is, and you'll know what he wants to steal. Um, the tribute space allows you to discard any two items from the board um, that, as long as they are Dwarf King cards, um, Gem Market cards, uh, uh, tunnel tiles, or uh, sorry, mine tiles, or um, in this case, if you're using the expansion, you can also discard spell cards. Okay, <clears throat> and then uh, the treasure hoard here finally is you can just take two gold from the bank and then again roll the die and see if you've angered the dragon. Okay, so um, those are all of the action spaces on the board. Um, let me go ahead and just uh, quickly explain what gets added in from the uh, expansion. So like I said, you add this um, board here. If you can see, it's like a, actually a little separate board. It just slides up next to the main board. And um, when you add the expansion in, you get two main things, right? You get the Wizard's Cave, which is another all-play space where you can go get two of the purple magic gems and also claim a spell card from this um, display. Now, as you can see, the spell cards, they all require a certain number of magic points to cast. Like in this case, the illusion spell, it costs one purple gem. You have to discard a purple gem from your supply in order to cast the spell. 
And each spell obviously does a little something different. They're all pretty cool. I won't bother explaining them now, but that's how the spells work. You can have um, up to three face-up spell cards in your display or in your space at any one time. That's considered your spell book or your spell library. So all players know what spells everybody has, and you can only have up to three at any one time. Uh, the other action space that's added is the Mana Cave, where you can basically come down here and get two purple gems. And then again, it's a dragon aggression spot. So you roll your die and see if you've, you know, upset the dragon. Um, and then, like I said, there'll be, you know, some additional tiles in the stack here that um, will help you get purple gems, mine purple gems out of your, um, out of your mine. That's what the, uh, the expansion adds in. Okay, and just in case you were curious, this is the box cover for the expansion called Caverns of Gandam. All right, so that's what gets you that little sideboard, spell cards. Um, the other cool thing that the expansion adds in, I'm um, sorry for the bump there, is um, it actually gives you two decks of Automa cards. So um, this is an example of an Automa card deck. Um, and basically it allows you to play like a solo game against up to two Automa opponents. So you can effectively play a three-player game with just a single human player. Um, you can also add in a single Automa deck in a two-player game. Uh, to again simulate having it be have three players uh, it keeps the game tighter um, and um, the actually the automa decks work really really well I've played a couple of solo games already now against two automa players and they're pretty tough um, and it really gives you that feel of you know uh, getting your workers bumped and getting extra actions with them and you know getting denied certain cards and things like that because the other players are taking them so it really really does a nice job of simulating that multiplayer feel all right, so that, folks, again, is Treasure Mountain uh, by August Games. And uh, if you like it, I hope you get a chance to check it out. And thanks for watching.